Hey everyone, welcome back to the I Heart Podcast. My name is Jonathan North, and welcome to the sixth episode. In a way, this is kind of the second half of the very first episode of the show. If you recall, in that one, I said I had originally planned for it to be an extra long episode with two reviews, right up until I changed my mind at the last second. So this episode was what was originally going to be the second segment of that episode. I had chosen this review as one to feature on the podcast because I really think it shows how some of the best discussions can come from some of the worst films. Sarah and I have seen a lot of different versions of Alice in Wonderland since we started making Wonderland Wednesday together, but for some reason, some of my favorite episodes that we've made have come from some of my least favorite versions that we've seen. Case in point, we decided to review the 1931 version, which was the very first version of Alice in Wonderland to be made with sound. With that in mind, you'd think that this was just going to be an interesting little black and white film from days gone by. A quaint little glimpse into film history. Nope. This was a cheaply made film with terrible special effects, horrible acting, nightmarish costumes, hilariously disturbing deviations from the source material, and an Alice who seemed to have more than a few screws loose or something. Whatever the case, the movie was terrible, but our discussion was a lot of fun. Hey everyone, welcome back to Wonderland Wednesday. Today we're talking about the 1931 version of Alice in Wonderland. Actually, the first version with sound. The other versions before this all were silent. So this was not the first like big major Hollywood feature though. This was just the first one with sound and it really shows because I think we're in agreement that this is our least favorite of all the ones we've watched. I still say they could have done this so much They They could have better. done it better, yes. When it first started, I was like, yeah, this this may not be half bad, because it started with a song that was, like, really catchy. It was a song that sounded like it was of the time. It was, like, nice. I really liked it. Historically interesting, clever, perky. It was Irving Berlin, and I'm wondering how he felt about, like, oh, my goodness, <laughs> they have my song. I have now seen what they have done. Um, but he's not here to tell us. I don't know, you know... <laughs> Yeah, uh, if it were me, I would be mortified to have my song attached to this. When it first started, I thought that this was not going to be that bad, but then when the song was over, it went downhill quickly. Hey, Jonathan from 2019 here again. I just wanted to cut in for a second and point out that while we were recording this episode, as you can tell here, we made a point to specifically mention that one of the only good parts of the film was the song at the very beginning. However, after our review went up, one of our viewers let us know that the song had actually been stolen from another film. The theme song for this movie had originally come from a movie that had been released the year before this one, Puttin' on the Ritz. This song has since been cut from that film, but I thought it was kind of hilarious and ironic that the best part of this film had been stolen from another movie. Which, as you'll see later on in our review, wasn't the only thing that they stole to make this one. Okay, back to the show. I had seen a tiny clip of this version, just a little bit of footage of this version, and I knew it wasn't going to be, I wasn't really expecting it to be amazing, Mm -hmm. but this was, (laughs) this was amazingly bad. Yeah. I was literally, I was, we were amazed. There was one point where she literally gasped at how terrible something that we watched was. Did I? Oh, okay. So, after the song, we have a really long, extended sequence of her sitting on the ground. I think the song was basically put there to explain how she got to Wonderland, because when it opens, she's already in Wonderland. She was just looking around and looking around, and then finally she starts into the dialogue, and they could have gotten to that way sooner than they did. It was ridiculous. And then... Once she does start, she started to give me the impression that she had been nipping at the bathtub gin. (laughs) Too much. A lot of people in this film had a very odd way of talking, and I'm wondering if nobody learned their lines because most people looked like they were looking off camera, Mm -hmm. perhaps reading cue cards. Not all of them, but Alice, it was... Alice especially. She was the worst one. It was really pronounced because she's trying to be really perky and animated and yet staring off into the distance. Like, okay It was just really odd. 
I liked some of her line delivery, but the fact that she was staring off into space with a sort of vacant look on her face. It was all wrong. It gave it a really weird feeling. And one of the things that I kind of went on about was I was confused what they were trying to communicate more with her because she's in this sort of little flapper length dress, but yet she's in full makeup and she's talking in this sort of childlike put on innocent way. It's like, are you trying to communicate adult or child here? You're not succeeding properly at either. I kind of figured it was supposed to be somewhere in between. And one of the things I found really interesting is like in this era of all the curls, they had her in really long straight blonde hair, not bobbed at all. And I don't know if it was a wig or what. Looked real. It did. So that it was, was just the most kind realistic looking thing on anyone's head in this entire movie. It was just kind of not a hair. It was a hairstyle that you wouldn't expect at that time. So yeah, interesting style choices as far as the way they dressed her and portrayed her. Not what you would expect of the era for me personally. And I grew up watching movies from the 30s. So after her excruciatingly long monologue, <laughs> She's interrupted by the white <laughs> rabbit, who is probably something that could be described His as favorite stuff of character. nightmares. <laughs> this was literally the worst white rabbit costume I have ever seen. I wasn't it was really hideous. I wasn't really bothered by the rabbit, but we each had our things, uh, mutual things as well. But this one really bothered him. If you saw this thing coming at you in a dark alley, you would run for the hills. What did it, I say? Like it's coming for you, but that's because I knew he already didn't like it. She gets a hold of his fan and gloves for just a little bit and then tosses them back at him. And she never goes to his house. And then they do this weird, I don't know if corny's the right word. It's like they're stretching and shrinking the screen, and it's like they're, they were trying to portray her size changing, but the mushrooms are right there with her. And they're stretching as well. And there was nothing yeah. in the script to indicate that that's what was going on. It was just like somebody was trying out a special effect, and it wasn't working, but they put no. it in the film anyway. No, they could have done something way more simple, like have her next to a little mushroom and then have her next to a big mushroom. It could have been that simple. It wouldn't have been super impressive, but it would have gotten the point across and she could have delivered some more little over animated spaced out lines there for you. Anyway, sorry. Um, After that, she goes to the Duchess's house and it does not look like a house where a Duchess would live because it's like a little farmhouse uh, with a wooden gate unpainted looked like an unpainted picket fence goes into a regular house she the duchess and the cook weren't bad costume wise we've seen they were probably the best costumes we, we've seen well some of the best costumes we've seen i mean they had the duchess in large headgear and they pretty much just put something on their noses to make their noses look funky i thought they made the noses look sort of like a pig Sort of foreshadowing the oh, pig maybe, transformation. Maybe that's what they are. I didn't think that deeply <laughs> on it. Congratulations. Um, this was one of the most bizarre, unexpected things in this film. I have never seen this, and it was like a horror film. Like Truly, what? truly like a horror film. Okay, so first, The Duchess scares off the cook she's she's fed up with the cook's pepper and she's explaining about how the pepper disturbs the baby and she probably does a poorly sung song i yeah. mean she did sing it but nobody was in opera on this mm -hmm. version. trust me nobody was in opera on this version otherwise they were hiding their light under a bushel there was there were plenty of songs in this version but the only one worth listening to was the one at the very beginning so the baby pig transformation was done differently. It was all done in the kitchen. The pig runs off, like, out of the kitchen. 
And then Alice is talking about how it makes a rather handsome pig and, you know, maybe wasn't the best looking baby or... The, most of the dialogue is the same as what it was in the book, except she's speaking to the Duchess instead of to herself. Right. And the pig looked relatively cute. It was a different sort of pig because usually you see pink and this one was like a black and white or black and pink. It was black and white film, so I can't tell you. Mm -hmm. Anyway... I think what they were trying to communicate next was that the Duchess was offended by this comment? I don't really know. They were talking about the Queen and how the Queen beheads people. It, there was a lot of dialogue that was added in that was not in the book. That was rather confusing. Somebody was having way too much creative license here. So this was the bizarre part. The Duchess gets up, goes over into another area of the kitchen, picks up an axe, and very slowly, emphasis, comes towards Alice with the axe. But they don't show it from a side angle. It's like she's coming at you mm -hmm. with an axe. And then they switch over to Alice's face and her hand is like on her throat. And she lets out a blood curdling scream and the Duchess chases her out of the house and is talking about, I think, how the Queen will behead her. But it was so It was so bizarre. And then later on, she Alice is acting like she's on the Duchess's side and like nothing has happened even though she's acting like a maniac killer towards her earlier in the film. Consistency, I think not. Well, nobody, neither character was acting like someone would act if this were happening in real life. Because mm -hmm. if somebody was coming at you with an axe and they were wanting to kill you, they'd probably be moving a lot faster than the Duchess was. And if someone was coming at you, you'd be running away, not standing in the place where you were, looking she up kept, at them. You remember she kept doing that little fake tremble thing, like, oh, I'm so scared in more than one scene. It, the whole thing was just so bizarre. Like, bizarre what? hardly even describes it. It's like, what are you, 27 and you're acting out this part? Anyway, okay. And I don't care if, if it's Wonderland. There is a line, people. <laughs> you can be weird in Wonderland, but this is not this okay. Is not the, this is not the kind of weird that you would expect it's from Wonderland. It's supposed to be fun weird. Yeah. Not psychotic killer death weird. Alice leaves the house right after that and then she's acting like nothing even happened and she comes upon the Cheshire Cat. It's the gin. <laughs> Who was not, the Cheshire Cat was not in the kitchen scene at all. No, but he talked like he was because he asked her what, ha what became of the baby, like he knew what was going on. It was like they used dialogue from the book that didn't make any sense because this did not happen outside like he it did in the book. They were quite true to the book in this scene, but it was painful. And yes. I don't mean literally painful, just that emotional pain. This guy was such an over-actor, like trying to be a cat, like meowing every word. He it just kept terrible. He kept making cat noises in between his lines and fake laughing and... I mean, the costume wasn't great, but if he had been good, yeah, uh, it would have been okay. If he I, had, if he had just been sitting there calmly and just a little bit of silly, because mm -hmm. the Cheshire Cat isn't over the top. No, he's supposed to be kind of understated crazy. But this one, I think I said, I never expected a Cheshire Cat that would make me think that the 1915 version was good. Because compared to this one, the horrible cat from the 1915 version, I thought was great. Was that the dismembered head one? Yes. Yeah, much easier to watch the dismembered head one. And that scene took too long, too. Okay, so we're getting to the end of the Cheshire Cat. And they have this little inset of his face. To suppose, you know, it's supposed to communicate the fade-out thing. I'm thinking the 1903 version had this technology. And this is 
and they didn't do that much of it. They just took too, line, too long on his lines and then had, oh my goodness, oh, it was so bad. It, so I don't know if they were inspired by the 1903 version to do that. I feel like whoever made this film might have seen and or watched footage of the other versions and sort of cherry-picked ideas out of them. But I can't say. I was just, since we've watched all the ones before this, I was picking up on stuff. So after the Cheshire Cat scene is over, she goes on to the Mad Tea Party. Jonathan may have been even more disturbed by the March Hare than the White yes. Rabbit. The March Hare was hideous. The he nose. He didn't really bother me. I was more bothered by the Dormouse and especially by the Mad Hatter, who, if we had to vote for worst character in this film, he might just take first. He yes. was maybe in his 50s? I'd say older than 50s. 60s? at least 60s yes retirement age and he could have given this part a little bit of dignity but but he, he did not no the way he acted it out was incredibly obnoxious when he sang his song <sighs> it was like in falsetto slash off key like he was trying really hard to make it sound terrible and he succeeded wonderfully well. Most of the time when you think of the Mad Tea Party you think of crazy in a fun way. Yeah. Like eccentric. This was crazy as in disturbingly off balanced. Like these people might come to kill you in the middle of the night. They I don't were know. very disturbing. I was mostly disturbed by the Mad Hatter and just how incredibly obnoxious he was in this role. I was, you were just ready for the scene to end and not to see him again. I was not ready to see him again in the court scene and that's another story in itself. The Dormouse was not, he didn't have a whole lot of lines so he wasn't horrible but the costume was, it was just weird. It was weird. You couldn't really see the eyes, so it looked like some sort of faceless hair like, alien. Like, it was kind of hard to tell. They had these little round bits, and it's like, well, maybe those are his eyes? And it was it was strange. He yeah. reminds me of some... Oh, I know what he reminds me of. He reminds me of that killer mole on that one movie. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what movie? Uh, the one where they're living underground. And... Is this a horror movie or a kid's no, movie? No, a kid's movie. Where it's like they had to go for safety underground, but then they're being kept there, and then they have to, a couple of them have to sort of pioneer the way out of there. And, okay. Was this yeah. The Secret of Nim? Maybe? Was it a movie about mice? No. Oh, well, I don't know what you're talking about. It was then. like there was an apocalypse or something, and they had to take refuge in the center of the earth, and then people forgot that there was anything else. Like there, there was an, a world up there, and it was like a mayor was trying to control them and, I to see this. and prevent this them. Weird. And it was based off of a book and prevent them from going back to the surface because I think he knew. And then these kids make their way to the top, but there is this killer mole on the loose, which wasn't necessarily in the book, and it had those little, little things, and he eats the mayor. Spoiler. Um, <laughs> we're getting off track. Yeah, blooper, quite, re blooper reel. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There might be quite a few bloopers. Uh, we'll see. Unusually so. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so the tea party setup wasn't that bad. Like the table, it looked like they had some nice china that maybe they borrowed from cast members. Um, and they also did the thing of the teapot that wasn't there being there. And it was like they tried to explain the craziness of putting the dormouse into the teapot by saying that because Alice left in a huff, or Alice left upset that it was all the Dormouse's fault and they're gonna stuff him in the teapot, which didn't need explanation. In other versions, it was just adorable, but whatever. And the teapot they tried to stuff him in wasn't even big enough for him. Not that that matters, but it was just like, if you're gonna have a teapot appear out of nowhere to stuff the mouse into, why not just have a teapot appear that's big enough? This one was just like slightly oversized, that 
It's not big enough for anything. I wasn't even thinking that through. <laughs> Maybe still in shock from the Hatter <laughs> anyway. Um, then she moves on to one of the better parts of the movie. Not her, because she was still terrible in this scene. But the Caterpillar was actually pretty good. His costume wasn't that great, but the actor was one of the only actors that I actually liked. He, he had a great voice. I liked the way he delivered his lines. He was yes. he was fine. Why couldn't the others they, even be fine? They had him crawl off, which was unnecessary, but he did try and do the caterpillar motions instead of just like, oh, I'm dragging myself off. He tried to act like a caterpillar. Mm -hmm. So she still had her spacey, half-drunken way of delivering the lines. And they had these little insets for you, our old Father William, to try and depict the story, but they weren't... They weren't fantastic and they weren't necessary. They probably wasted money on that, but whatever. <laughs> um, and after that rare person in the film that amused us and made us happy, she moves on to the Queen's Courtyard, which they did find a place that looked halfway decent. And the costumes looked halfway decent this here, too. This was a part that was surprising, because with as bad as the film was, they actually had some rather over-the-top costuming for the courtyard people. And I don't know where they could have borrowed it from, because they did try and stick with the card motif. I mean, some of them weren't. And they had children involved in it with these little gauzy... Oh bits of fabric on their arms and they tried to make that really nice. It's like if they had put that much effort into other parts of the film, it could have been really good. Um, and the queen I thought was an interesting choice. Her character, not all, there were unnecessary things about her character, but the person that they chose was- She was halfway decent in comparison to everyone else. She was halfway decent at her part. I think pretty good. Maybe part of it was the lines she was given. Like, mm. just calling somebody stupid. It was just awkward. <laughs> and she had this ra she had this young, elegant appearance where you wouldn't really expect that of the queen character. Mm. Um, and then, of course, the Duchess comes back on the scene, and Alice saves her from the Queen, which is like... It's, it was really bizarre, because the Duchess had just threatened her life with an axe less than a half hour before this, and suddenly, for some strange reason, she's on the Duchess's side trying to save her from being beheaded, and then, and then they're like besties. They walk off together. And there was made-up dialogue in this as well. It was just, it, it made so little sense. And they wander off to the Gryphon, yes. which according to them was apparently the way to pronounce that. Like everybody what? pronounced it as Gryphon. It's a griffin. I don't know where they got the pronunciation of Gryphon from. One of the things I expected from this film that you see on Wikipedia is that they struggled with the British accents. That is totally marginal compared to other yeah, things. Yeah, that's the with least problem of this film. It didn't even like, occur to me that they were struggling with accents. Most of them sounded American, anyways. I they thought. sounded fine. That was not the problem. And even if they had had terrible accents, you think about Mary Poppins did a bad accent in their wreck the movie no it's a classic there was yeah marginal okay so alice wanders off with the griffin thank you very much to hear the mock turtle story and the griffin i think the costume wasn't amazing but it wasn't terrible and the griffin character like not that the singing voice was amazing, but it wasn't in comparison. I suppose, yeah, it in wasn't comparison, that it was bad. Sort it, of it sounded almost like a, a kid yeah, in there. That, I I, it maybe maybe been. a young boy, 
like young teens maybe. So the griffin comparatively was okay. The mock turtle was one of the worst Ugh. characters. Painful he, to listen to him. He was so fake. The, the the shell part of his costume was okay, but the paint on his face made him look like a rock and his voice was grating. Um, the costuming, while kind of weird, wouldn't have been that bad in comparison to the fake crying and just the way he Ugh. delivered his part. The fake crying was so awful. And wasn't he another one of those that looked like he was looking off to read his lines, maybe? Yes, most of the people and looked like they were looking off screen. This was the part that made my jaw drop. I she was literally gasped. And I, I was like, oh my word. I was in shock, but that's my 21st century brain. So the griffin starts singing sort of the lobster quadrille yeah, song. Yeah, this is, this is the part with the lobster quadrille. And they literally stole the scene from the 1915 version for this. And with the it, walruses dancing with the lobsters. And put it as an inset. And... I don't know if I was... It was just shocking. I don't know how insulted I was by that, but it's kind of like, I know that movie! You ripped off that movie! And this is not like, even we're not even that attached to the 1915 version, because it was not that great. But this was it, only 16 years later, and they took somebody else's content and yeah. shoved it into their terrible version. And it was one of the better parts of the 1915 That's probably version. What, what's mo the most upsetting about it, was because it was one of the best parts of the 1915 version. And, like I and say, they just straight up stole it. And I'm not even sure how upset I am. I was just shocked, because it shows you, I think, what might have been more acceptable at that time, whereas now people are... Copyright so law has been changed so much that this would never fly today. And I think sometimes things can be so extreme, like so extremely careful to the point of, like, we know what this product is, why can't you just say it out loud? But back then, <laughs> apparently it was much different. So yeah. I was probably overly shocked, but you know, We both were, but she was more audibly shocked. <laughs> um, and then, once they got past that very interesting part, they end up singing together, and I'm not even sure if they had all the lyrics right, like in unison, or whether there was like a little fake accent difference that was throwing I, me off, I don't know. and they did a terrible job. And shortly after that, this seemed like it was inspired by the 1915 version as well because you have this prolonged calling to the trial of Tarts by the rabbit and he comes there and gets Alice. So they go to the trial and it was long drawn out with plenty of things thrown in that weren't in the story. Uh, the Mad Hatter, especially. This was shocking, might be too strong of a word, but it was, I think he was shocked. I was shocked. The Mad Hatter, it was like, well... Okay, I'm he comes in, and he does the thing of biting his teacup, which it took me a minute to realize what had happened, because he looks like he's throwing up in the courtroom. And then... It's being discovered that he, I think, the, it's like the queen was on to him that he was this terrible singer. And then the punishment is supposed to fit the crime, so didn't she want him to like dance and sing? And he was saying that he could, he couldn't do that because of his warped time thing. Something like it's like always, that. it's always tea time. And then it was almost like he was trying to carry out his sentence, and so he did this sort of crazed, pained dance. And Alice is like sobbing in the background. Yes. And it's they, just so bizarre. Then he falls down and I'm like, is he dead? He was dead. He was dead. They, they, they put him in a burlap sack and propped him up against the wall and moved on with the trial. I, I think that they just like covered him with this raggedy looking sack. Thing. And it was like they, they put him outside or something and just left the body there. And 
Alice recovered very quickly from this horrific experience, yes, as usual. Because bizarrely of, quickly. Yeah. Which is not anything unusual for her character because she got over so many things so quickly. They also had a scene where it was like the Dormouse had been taken away and then the Dormouse was back in the jury. So it didn't. There was no continuity in this movie because at one point the Mock Turtle and the Griffin were in the courtyard scene earlier and then they were asleep on the beach. So there was no continuity paid attention to. The cook managed to get away without dying. <laughs> one, good for her. And Jonathan noticed when the rabbit kept blowing his horn, it was like he was making the noises with yes. his mouth. It looked so wrong. The other guys blowing horns. That the other one, it was the, yeah, the other people blowing the horns, they just put a sound of a horn being blown. It was fine. Sure. Oh, the poem. The poem. They read the poem, but the poem took forever. It was just like... Every verse was read and analyzed and stuff was put in that didn't need to be put in. And they were like trying to figure out this... There was a re There's a reference in the poem to she. So they assumed that since they have it in their heads that the Jack or the Knave of Hearts is the one who stole the tarts, he must be have stolen them for a girl. So they're trying to get this information out of him. And for some reason, they just assume it's the Duchess. I'm not sure why they just assume this. But it turns out they assumed correctly, and then they're threatening her life if she does not reveal who stole the tarts. There's also this line in there where the knave is acting like, well, if it had been for Alice, he would have been glad to steal these tarts. It's like, okay, so now she's an adult. Is she that an you're adult or is she a child? Because the knave is real creepy if she's supposed to be a child. And he's definitely an adult. Yes. Whatever. But then when, as they're threatening the duchess, she's refusing to give up who her love is and they're going to force her to marry the knave and then and he's acting like this is a horrible thing to have happen to him he's which was kind of funny he's maybe in his 20s and she's maybe in her 50s, 50s. so it would have been an awkward pairing and then the rabbit confesses and he wants to take the punishment because i mean it's like they're supposed to be the, apparently the rabbit and the duchess are in love and we're wondering if perhaps they saw the play from the 1927 version because in that one we found it rather weird that the rabbit and the duchess were going to get married. But in that one it was just kind of cute and odd. Yeah. In this, this one was one, just, what? Shortly thereafter Alice really starts to get into trouble and she acts like, you know, you're nothing but a pack of cards. She gets all defiant again. Right. And then it was like the people in the courtroom were gathering, but you don't have cards flying up right away. They start making an image of her spin around and around on the screen, and they belabored it, and slow... Just took so long. Slowly more cards start flying at her. For some reason, they decide to transition to her back in the real world with her head floating in the middle of the screen like like just her hair hanging down i i don't know what they were trying like, to do they even convey have her, with this do they even have her neck i don't think so i'm not really sure it didn't make any sense and it was just another thing that was just so bizarre i feel like we've used the word bizarre so many times in this review but that's really the only way we can describe a lot of what happened. This, and this was another part that was weird because it's like she, was this just me? It seemed like she woke up in a modern, for the time, like a 1930s setting out on this little swing in the yard. And then her mother, I think, calling from what looks like a stucco house for her to come in and have some tea or something. Yeah, it was, What? it made no sense. This might seem like kind of a it's hyperbolic, the right word, review, but it really did get such a strong emotional reaction from us. We, t we, we said we should have filmed this as a reaction video. It totally could have been. I mean, because we, were, we kept stopping it to talk about, did we just see what just happened? 
it was we had so many strong reactions if we had done this as a react video it probably would have been even been more entertaining than this review and even just laughing half like half of half it, in shock yeah and half this is so bad it's funny yeah this is probably a film that people would watch just because it's so bad if you want to if you're one of those people put this on your list yes this there's no other way to describe this as it's not entertaining for entertainment's sake, it's entertaining for how absolutely awful it is. We could have quit just maybe 15 minutes in and said, okay, this is terrible, don't watch it, but there is that little part of you that's curious what is coming later on, and if we're going to do a thorough review, I guess maybe we should watch the whole thing, but painful. Mm -hmm. On a different note... <laughs> Um, I kept looking at her clothes, like, oh, is that a floral print or what's going on with her, trying to figure out what her apron was, and I don't know how much this is going to get edited out. She had a really different apron in that it was like a half apron with long straps and then these little ruffled caps on it. I don't think I've ever seen an apron style like that. It's not essential, but it, it's really, that was another interesting style choice. And if that gets cut out, I will try and be understanding because there was a, there's a lot that you're going to be trying to put, put into this. Um, if Jonathan were to rate this movie, he would give it a half star, right? Well, when I first started watching it, I was thinking it was probably going to be like two, two and a half because the music was fine, but it dropped from there. Like halfway through, I was thinking this is probably going to be more like one and a half stars. And then... In the courtroom scene, I was thinking, this is going to be one star. And then the Mad Hatter literally died on screen. I was like, this is going to be a half a star. I think maybe it's just like the tiniest tip of one star point. <laughs> but that's not a thing. Yeah, it was... It just... Don't do it. Just don't do it. This movie was bizarre, and we don't recommend watching it unless you like watching really awful movies. Not even to examine the period because there are other films that would be better to examine the period. You know, if you're interested in what Irving Berlin did to communicate the story, you could maybe watch the first minute or whatever that was, but turn away. <laughs> that was dramatic, wasn't it? <laughs> other versions of Alice in Wonderland that I want to feature on the podcast, but like I said in the first episode, I'm going to make sure I spread them out. I want this podcast to be as varied as my interests. In the future, I do want to introduce you to another version, one of the weirdest Alice in Wonderland adaptations, a 1988 stop-motion version from Czechoslovakia. But in the meantime, there are some great episodes coming. Next week, my friend Rachel Wagner will be joining me, and we are counting down our top 10 movies of 2018 as well as a few of our least favorites, just to keep things interesting. We had a lot of fun recording that one, and I'm excited to share it, so we'll see you then.